Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Drive Formula podcast, where we're talking about the book Driving Engagement. And uh, my name is Marcus Williams. This is Eric Lichty, and today is our deep dive into Chapter Four. So, if you are subscribed and been following along, uh, apologize we haven't posted in, in a couple of weeks. We've both been sick, so we're back, um, ready to go, and excited to dive into this chapter. There's a lot of really interesting things here, and hopefully, some kind of aha moments of, you know, how are you reading the sensors of what's happening in your workplace and kind of comparing those to cars. So as always, um, we hope you follow along with the book. You can pick up Driving Engagement uh, online, wherever books are sold, and follow along, mark it up, make notes. If you have questions, please put them in the comments or send them, send us an email, uh, support at thedriveformula.com. And we'd love to discuss those in these episodes. So deep dive into chapter four today, and then next week we'll be reading chapter five. So you get this kind of enhanced audio book is what we're calling it. All right. So chapter four, heating the sensors. Uh, we kind of start out with, you know, every vehicle is designed to work. Every part has a job to do. And there's sensors that tell you whether or not that's happening. So if a part is not doing its job, a sensor senses that and sends you a signal saying we've got a problem here and we need to fix it. And the same type of thing happens in your business as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a car's an amazing machine that has all these moving parts that have to be all in time. They have to be uh, monitored and they have to do their jobs to transport you from lo one location to another. But when one sensor goes out, it makes everything not work efficiently. And so that's why it has a diagnostic system. And as a mechanic, I can go in and I can get that computer code, but that code could mean five or six different things. And it could actually be with a totally different system as well. And so as we diagnose in a job environment, there is many aspects that really go into diagnosing um, to say that we're professionals in supply chain. No, not as much, but we are professionals with employees. If employees have an issue and they're not uh, operating at their efficiency, it could be because the leaders, it could be because the ergonomics, it could be because the software issues, it could be a number of things that is wrong. So yes, we don't know everything about supply chain, but your employee does. That's who we are actually going to be talking to is the employees, the leaders, see where there's a communication gap, see why it's not working correctly. So really, we can go into any environment, diagnose what's going on, and come up with a problem uh, solving technique to go along with it. <coughs> the big thing is that it's really about small, simple shifts. We don't really want to ever see anybody fired. We don't want anybody to be reprimanded. We look at the past so that we can help your future and become more productive, more effective, and look and appreciate the, the jobs that everybody does. Everybody has a key part, including the leaders. If they don't do them, then the job doesn't get done. The environment is not productive. Um, if there's emotional issues as well that... Let's talk about anger for a minute. All right. I love this because what is the purpose of anger in a workplace environment? There's none. Exactly. <laughs> Disappointment by because somebody didn't do a job. But people are people and accidents right. will happen. They will not be perfect all the time. We are human beings and we make mistakes. It's about the reaction. But to use anger, think about it. If somebody walked in a room... I had a boss that would walk in the room and he absolutely did not like me because of my religion. I've mentioned this before. I went into tunnel vision. I was like narrow vision, my creativity just gone. I'm just like, okay, just say the basic minimum so he doesn't go off on me or do something to have another excuse to not like me because I did very well. At the end of my, on my exit interview, they said they never had anything to worry about. But yet his presence just coming in, just seeing him was like, ah, you know, and just sit, shivers down my mind, mind and or my body. And I would often leave and make sure I was doing something busy. So I didn't have to talk to him. Yeah. I mean, I've had. I've had a screamer, an angry boss before, too. And you just you don't want to go to work. You get sick. It affects you physically. It's in your stomach. Like 
it affects every portion of it. The interesting story is without, you know, naming names or anything, you were recently talking to a senior leader in a business about um, what we do and they, and the fact that they had just done an employee survey. And in that survey, it showed that there was a major morale issue and it was around leadership. So they had a serious problem in their organization with leadership and somehow their the trust wasn't there, whatever it said. Yet he was hyper-focused on the fact that it was a process issue or, it, you know, you needed to know about how they made their product and was completely ignoring. It was like, it was like the oil sensor was going off and he was checking the gas. Yeah. Like he was completely looking at the wrong thing. And that like every sensor in a car is you have a separate light, you have a separate code that goes off to tell you specifically what to look at. You can't fill air in the tires if your oil's low and expect to solve the problem. And, and that's essentially what the senior leader was trying to do. Ignore the fact that there was a leadership issue. I think partially because he was a leader. So yeah. it was pointing at him negative, negatively and nobody likes that, but he was looking, he was, he had a clear sensor telling him there was a problem and he was trying to ignore it and deflect it. It's never going to solve the problem that way. Never. And I mean, a leader has a huge amount of just presence within the organization. I mean, if you go into your car and you're angry, you're going to start driving angry. Your car's going to know it because you're pushing the gas harder, you're pushing the pedals, the brake harder. You are just, you know, you're driving angry, which is not a good thing because that's a machine. It's just going to break on you. Right. You know, you keep driving and abusing it. Well, people are the same way and they can feel that tension almost instantly. And presence as a leader coming into the room you're there to be a visionary. You're there to be a help. You're there to help fix whatever problem is, make the job environment the best that you can so employees can thrive and not have to be worried. You know? Yeah. And I mean, you tell a similar story in the book about a guy who called you. He had a vintage truck and he calls you and he was convinced. He was absolutely convinced yeah. that it was one problem. And you're saying, no, 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 you got to check. It's not actually that complicated. It's the tires. Just listen, listen to what your car is telling you. And in the middle of that conversation, his tire blew. Yeah, it was funny because he started all sorts of sentences. He's like, I got to go by. <laughs> I was like, buddy, I was trying to tell you, I need to look at it first. You know, I can't diagnose over the phone. That's just impossible. But this is what it could be. And he was arguing with me. And then it happened. I'm like, well, solidified what I was saying. Yeah. And, some, and sometimes there's great value in having an outside source come in and look talk to people look at what's going on to really diagnose what's happening because when you're in it and you're part of it it's really hard to self-diagnose absolutely i mean you know this you you feel sick and you look at try to self-diagnose and look it up online it's going to tell you you're dying yeah you're gonna be dead by tomorrow so you go to a doctor because the doctor has that you know, that yeah. greater perspective yeah the diagnostic abilities right but i want to reaffirm that when we come into an environment, we want to help leaders. We want to help employees to have a better working environment. Our purpose is never to fire. Our purpose is to look for solutions to change and just make simple shifts to how the job environment is on attitude, on appreciation, on making sure that it's like those people that are doing all the work actually feel appreciated because the majority of the time they don't. And if a leader comes in and they're, you know, they're grumpy or they send out a video, you guys need to be more motivated like the military or something like that. What are you telling them? Are you going to war? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, that is not how you motivate somebody in the regular work environment. Um, nothing bad against motivational speakers that are ex-military. We absolutely need them. But I'm just not motivated by their stuff as much. And some people are. But me personally, I like to be positive. I like to use positive psychology and look at the situation greater and say, what can we do to really help these people to have a good working experience? Right. And, and as human beings, we don't like to acknowledge our own faults. That's no. just, that's natural. And we, we understand that. And we, I mean, once you just admit that <laughs> you've already taken a step, but in the book, we talk about how a lot of times we, we see the warning sign the sensor goes off 
But instead of acknowledging where the actual blame is, we turn around and blame the employee for that. Um, one example is employee suffering from job fatigue, right? So kind of the natural response is, well, that's their problem. They need to go to bed earlier and get more sleep. Well, what if you shift your thinking and you say, maybe they're not in a role that they're qualified for and that's why they're overwhelmed they're overwhelmed they have job apathy low job satisfaction you know when your car throws in oil light you don't blame the car it's uh-huh. not the car's fault you fix it by adding oil so i think that happens a lot and there's a couple more examples in the chapter too that you know, really, you should look into and kind of self-analyze if you're doing that yourself. But change your perspective when you get those warning signs, because every leader has those, just like that senior leader you were talking yeah. to. Like He didn't just have – clearly, they did a survey for a reason. They knew there was a problem. So they, they had a clear indication there was a problem. They decided to diagnose that problem by sending out a survey. The survey told them where the – problem you know lay and where they needed to focus their solution and then he completely shifted the blame it wasn't his fault it was the employee's fault uh, and we and i think we do that all the time um i've i've heard multiple work. stories about that that they've done surveys and people the leaders always come back it nope it's the employees it's like an outside source says that it's you what's wrong with being a little bit humble be a leader that you can be trusted to be able to have somebody come to you with an issue. I mean, I just understand why it's hard to do that because as a leader, you have your own roles and responsibilities. I understand. But one of your roles and responsibilities is to create the right environment for the employees to thrive right. because they are doing the day-to-day work. You are just there to help um, build that environment so it's there so that they can thrive. Right, and it's like it's – most likely, it's a two, double-edged sword. Both of you need to do some shifting and adjusting. We're not saying it's always the leader's no. fault or that it's always the employee's fault. Uh, the The important thing is that you look at what they're, the sensor, what the signs are telling you, and you diagnose it properly so that you can fix it properly. Only deal, apply a solution that actually fixes your problem. Yeah. Don't change the brakes because your tri- tire tread is low. Yeah. You know, and as a leader, you should see that. I mean, if you were a coach on a team, you saw somebody on third base that was just not performing well. Um, they say that sports is 80 percent mental and 20 percent, you know, actual ability. Well, if they're having something in their mind that's holding them back, um, you need to see that as a leader and say, OK, let's talk. A lot of people just say, well, they're just not performing today bring them out, you know, and bring them out of the game. Let's put their back up in, but you need to see those signs. Another story that we mentioned in the the book is it's pretty funny because this person came in and it's like, I just had so many things to do. So I, uh, my check engine light came on and they said, you know, I, I can wait a couple of weeks to be able to see that. Well, that's a major sign that your engine is not running properly. So you could get bad gas mileage. You could have your engine blow up all sorts of things. Then they said that, oh, we noticed that there's fluids leaking in the garage that weren't there before. Well, there's a second sign. Um, So then they're like, well, I've got to drive about 15 miles to my first appointment, then another five miles to my second. Then I got to go drive 20 miles. I I just had to get it done. And I just didn't listen to the warning signs. Well, they made it to the first 10 miles. They made it the next five miles. So this car is doing excellent, showing all these signs, but still performing for them. Five miles back into their trip on their final thing, it died. It blew the motor. It was, it was gone. gone. And so how how many people in your work environment, I talked to somebody the other day that he was so stressed that it actually gave him a stroke. And this is a healthy male in his 50s. And he said that I could not work for the organization anymore because they put so much stress on me and I never had time with my family. I had no work uh, life balance. And his leader just overheated him yeah. completely to a medical problem. And I've I've had that, not a stroke, but health issues as well, where you need to listen to the people around you who love you, uh, who know you. And when they start telling you that you're, there's a problem, you're stressed out, you're, you're not 
there's a problem that you, you need to, that's your warning sign as an employee that something's got to give. And mm -hmm. you either need to talk to your employer and, and make those changes or need to find something else because is a job worth your health, your health, no. right? the rest of your life, your ability to see your kids, or your grandkids? Absolutely not. Of course it's not. Uh, what you said earlier reminded me, I just, I watched this documentary on the baseball player, Nolan Ryan, probably with the best yep. pitcher ever lived. And he, he went through a slump. He had, he had accuracy problems, which is weird to think because he's known for being like in the zone all the time. One of the most accurate pitchers ever. Um, but he suffered and they weren't playing him because he couldn't pitch accurately. And it took a pitching coach to come in and tweak his delivery just a little bit. Someone who was willing to, instead of just bench him, to look at, recognize he had the potential and the talent, really diagnose what the issue is. They tweaked a little bit, and then he probably had the most amazing pitching career of any pitcher in all of baseball. Because one guy decided to go in and take the time to diagnose him instead of throwing, a, throwing his career out the window. Yep. And then I'd... As a leader with our mechanic shop, we actually uh, hire a lot of recovered addicts and people that have been looked over in society. And it's amazing because they go into a lot of environments and people do not trust them from the beginning. Do you need to trust them? Yes, to a point you do. Do you need to be careful? Absolutely. Until they build that trust and show that they're not going to steal from you or anything. We've had some that don't do so well and some that do, but you have to give them that element of trust. What has your employees done to be treated negatively or with anger or with not listening to them? Have they really never have done something major that they should not have any trust with you? Yeah. I mean, that's a big issue is trust. Leaders need to have trust within their employees. They are the ones that are the professionals that you specifically hired for that um job and that those roles and responsibilities as a leader you cannot go in and do every job nor should you go in and every job do every job as a car operates down the road it is impossible for the driver to create an explosion to be able to propel the car forward it's impossible to do that job even for a flintstone yep you know you could actually push your car behind but it's still not going to go very far and do you really want to push your business like that right and you take all the weight on it why don't we trust our employees why don't we to build the environment for trust and let them fail a little bit but go in and say okay so this did happen what can we just learn from it and let's do better next time you always try to be positive. Instead, if you're negative, it's going to have a really detrimental uh, consequence. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about the the elephant in the room there with that topic of trust is there are going to be employees that do bad things. Yep. And, and that's, you know, we've talked about how our goal isn't to get anyone fired. It's to help them be productive because they applied for the job because they wanted it and you hired them because they were the best candidate, Right. But there are going to be employees that do bad things. Um, there are going to be employees that engage in sexual mis misconduct, who engage in fraud, who steal, who commit even commit crimes, uh, and you have to deal with that. So we're not saying that you have to keep these employees, no. right? But we are saying if that happens as a leader, it is your responsibility that, to initiate a professional investigation immediately and to then act upon the results of that investigation, no matter who that person is. Because misconduct can kill a team faster than anything, especially if they get away with it, especially yeah. if, they, if they see that nothing has happened. Um, I've looked at a lot of cases in the corporate world where someone was sexually harassing their employees, engaged in sexual misconduct, and the company didn't do anything in a time or or took so long to do anything that the employees lost trust in them and it's never there's never been a situation where that turned out good for the company it always no. ends up bad for the company mm -hmm. um, if you don't respond quickly and promptly so um when i say a professional investigation that doesn't mean that you call 
your friend George, who works down in the shop, to come and look into it. That means someone who actually knows what they're doing. That could be a law firm, um, but just because you're a lawyer doesn't make you an investigator. So don't, you need to not just go there right away. It could be a specialized investigations firm. It could be someone in your HR department if they've been trained. It kind of depends on your organization, but it needs to be a professional organization. The other big mistake that I've seen in those types of cases is that this guy over here who is very important to maybe he's the one who designed your best product or he you know is kind top of salesman. top salesman yeah they get a slap on the wrist but this other guy over here who's just a worker bee gets fired you want to kill your company do that you have to treat the misconduct as misconduct whether it's person a or person b that engages in it it's just as bad it's not okay for him who you know the person who's important to get away with it where the person who you can get rid of gets in trouble your employees see that and the first thing they they see is that you're going to protect your friends you're going to protect the people that you like and you're going to throw the people that you don't under the bus and you think there's a quicker way to lose trust than that <laughs> that actually happened to me in one of my the only job that I ever got laid off the the sales manager um flat out said that I had psychological issues as dealing uh dealing with in, in the team environment well the structure of the team environment was not there to succeed we had to split commissions we had to do everything so when he told me that I filed a hostile work environment what happened I got moved to a different area and eventually laid off through here and through the grapevine. That person had three different uh, suits against him and he was able to retire from the company about eight years later. And I am the one that got in trouble because I was the one that got attacked. I don't understand. I mean, that, that just killed my morale because I tried really hard in that job to do the best that I could and I still did the job, but my family was suffering because I was only getting paid half commission because I had to sell in a, a team sales environment. It just did not work. And that team sales environment after I got moved from it uh, was suspended three months later. Yeah. And so it didn't even work. But that person never got his consequences for the way that he acted and the way that he treated people. And yeah. coming from the investigator background as someone who's done these investigations, I've I've had lawyers come to me and say, how can we make this go away? Oh, you know, I've had, I've had prosecutors who have said, yeah, but you know, this is going to hit the news because he's a senior leader, you know, he did something wrong. And my response was, I don't care who it is. I don't, I don't care if it's the queen of Sheba. If this person engaged in misconduct, then there are, penalties to that and there are consequences to that and we're going to follow them no matter who they are because it needs to be equal for everyone because you will kill your company people will leave people will not want to work for you they'll stop being engaged in their work as soon as they believe that you're not going to protect them from the predators who are engaging that in that misconduct if they don't feel safe if they don't feel protected they will not do a good job for you in fact, they will, from that moment on, they're looking for a new job. So that, once again, goes back to just your loyalty to your employees. As a leader, I sincerely believe your job responsibility is to create the best environment for them to thrive. You cannot do their job. You have to realize that they are there doing the day-to-day -day jobs to make you the money to be able to grow your company. Why not appreciate them? Why not talk to them? Um, we have very basic things that trust communication and uh, action will accelerate your your job, your environment to, well. But it's about communication. It's about our organization and appreciation. Why is it so hard to share appreciation in the job environment? Yeah, me. <laughs> I don't understand. I mean... 
People do things every day. And some people are like, well, we pay them well. Yeah, but money is only so far. Yeah, and in fact, it, you know, we talk, I don't know if it was in this chapter, and I think it's in the next chapter, so we'll talk about it next time, that majority of people in this survey said they were willing to take a job cut for a job that they believe in. Yeah. Money is not the driving factor in people's lives. Maybe it was at one time, I don't know, but it's not. They People would rather be engaged and have a personal connection to their work and take less money than have the big paycheck and have a horrible life. Yep. I had to do a lot of studies on uh, Sir Richard Bonson, on Trader Joe's, all these people that created these right work environments, Zappa Shoes, uh, Zappos, um, all these leaders were like, they treated their employees like family and they were never better. People fight to get into the Virgin uh, empire of Sir Richard Bronson's at a lower pace or lower in uh, pay just to be in that environment. And it doesn't mean that you can't work them hard. No, you, know, they, you, you, you are paying them to do a job and there are expectations, you know, you set clear expectations that they'll do that, but you can still create a, an environment where they enjoy and feel inspired and engaged to do that job. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> I want to reiterate more than anything, we go in and we help people. People are what run business. It's impossible for machines to do everything that a human being can do. You have to have them. Create the right environment for them to thrive. Create the right area that they can just work as they want to work and work hard and then just show appreciation. Help them see the vision of why they are working for your organization. Don't ever be down on them. Don't be negative to them. And yes, sometimes you do have to um, discipline them. But at the end, find something that's positive about what they do. Never, ever leave a situation with the last thing saying that you sucked. You did something really bad. Instead, you know what? You do this really well. Yeah, you do need to work on some other things, but I really appreciate and I see what you are doing, and it is helping the organization move forward. That means so much more to an employee that you actually noticed and you took the time. Absolutely. And heed those warning signs, those sensors. Don't ignore them. No, because... Take action. And per employee burnout's a true thing, and retain your employees. They're valuable. People are awesome. And don't look at generations and blame generations. Each person has to be treated different. They're all individuals. You cannot teach your, treat your whole working force the same. Everybody has their own personalities. That's fine. That's why you hired them. Yeah. And that's, that's what fine. they need. If everybody was exactly the same, it would not work out. You need those different personalities. You need those different generations. It's just you have to lead them in different ways and you have to just um, learn how to treat them yep. and they will stick around. They are good employees. Uh, people are valuable and people are, do great things. Awesome. Yeah. So remember, pick up your copy of driving engagement next week. We will be, will be just the straight audiobook portion of chapter five. And then after that, uh, we'll do the deep, deep dive. So again, comments, questions, leave them here, or you can send us an email. Um, at support at the drive .com, and we'd love to include your comments your questions in these deep dive dive discussions uh, please excuse me i'll try to edit out the coughing but uh, there's still some lingering coughs yes. and the sicknesses so i'll do my best but may not may not be able to get all of them so uh, have a great week and we'll catch you next time on the drive formula podcast <laughs>